Susie and I work at the Cass County Public Library and I do some of the adult um, classes there at the library. And today we're going to kind of introduce you to air fryers and give you some ideas about maybe helping you decide which one to buy for yourself. And of course, I'm going to be giving you my personal opinion. I don't work for any of these companies. Um, I am a retired fax teacher and so I've had a little bit of experience in the kitchen. So. Uh, we're going to start out with um, the basic one that most people have, which is this one. Um, this is the large. They come in small, and I'm not going to get into brands too much, but maybe just a little bit. Um, what I'm going to tell you about this style, this one has a huge area in it, and you can put some dishes in there, but you're really going to be limited in how much you can cook and what you can use inside. The other thing that I feel is important about an air fryer like this is it has a nonstick coating and you're like, oh, that's great. If you feel comfortable with nonstick, then yes, it is great. I'm one that I feel like there are carcinogens whenever they're under high heat, which an air fryer definitely is. And so for me, this would not be my choice. Um, you can minimize that a little bit by putting parchment paper in the bottom or putting a dish. Um, and it also has several pieces that have to be cleaned in it and I just, for me, I don't think it cleans quite as easily as some of the others. The other style is like this one. Um, that happens to be my daughter's air fryer. This happens to be my son's. Um, this one is nice because it is stainless steel for the most part on the inside. It has a crumb tray that you can pull out to clean. Um, it also gives you a regular rack for baking, it gives you one for air frying, and then it gives you another one that you can use when you need a solid surface when you cook in it. Um, the exterior of this does become very hot when you use it. Um, one of the things I really, really like about this is that you can see inside. The other one, you have to open it and it has to stop every time you want to check anything. Um, one little tip about this one is after you're, you are done cooking, if you leave the door open, you won't get that smoky film or greasy film that you get on the front of any glass door appliance. So whenever I'm done, I always leave that open. Um, it's a touch screen, so that makes it pretty nice. This one I think he bought at Sam's Club, and it's an emerald uh, one. Now I'm going to show you my bias, because here's mine, and this is my favorite, and I always research before I buy something. This is the Cuisinart. I like it because it fits under my cabinet. It takes up very little space. I like to be able to have it near my stove. And I'll tell you, I don't hardly use my stove or my microwave or my oven at all. Most everything I do is in that little bitty air fryer. Um, this one has the, the crumb tray underneath that you can pull out for cleaning and it comes completely out. And then we also have the regular um, tray and then the basket and yes it does discolor it is all stainless steel which I feel really good about cleaning uh, about cooking with it when I clean it um, I just use this little bubble up just this is dish soap in this little thing and I just scrub it with it and it comes really really clean but it does discolor um, I also do what they don't recommend, but I'm going to tell you what I do anyway. I get these little sheets of aluminum foil, and you want to put it with the shiny side down so it doesn't reflect the heat. Even though I do that, this still is discolored, and I've had this, I don't know, a year or more. Um, and I don't let that bother me because I go, oh look, it's all clean. So that works great for me. So 99% of the time, this is what I cook on. It does come with another wrap, so if I'm going to bake, this is what I use when I'm going to bake. Um, the other thing that I like about this is its size. Um, I was helping to cook for a Thanksgiving dinner and we had one of those half pans, foil pans, full of dressing, and I couldn't get enough baked in my oven I got desperate, so I took everything out, and you know that thing went in there, and it baked beautifully. <laughs> and that makes me really happy when I can use my regular dishes. Um, I don't store in plastic because I like for anything that I have to um, be as serviceable as possible. So everything I have 
is glass. And I store in the glass, I bake in the glass, uh, I do everything in the glass. Um, I live in a small place and so I don't have room for all your Tupperware and all that kind of stuff and this. So I try to minimize and make sure that whatever I use um, is as most useful as it possibly can be. So what we're going to do today is I have uh, three recipes that I picked out of various cookbooks. Uh, to me, if I can't get at least three recipes out of a cookbook, it's a waste of my time. So over here, I'm going to show you what I used. <clears throat> I don't happen to have this book, but this is it was called Air Fry Everything by Meredith Lawrence. We do have this one in our Harrisonville branch and also I believe Garden City, I'm not sure. You'll have to check, check our website. The other one that I used is Air Fry Everything by Ben Mime. No, Mim, sorry. Um, but I really enjoyed both of those. And so the recipes I'm gonna share with you today came from those recipe books. So be sure to check those out. Um, one of the first things that I'm going to do is make apple fritters. Um, in the recipe they call for peach fritters this time of year, getting a good peach is hard to do. And I think canned peaches really don't taste like a real peach. So I elected to go with apples. And of course, I'm gonna go with your basic uh, Granny Smith apple because you can't get a good Jonathan this time of year. But my number one choice of apples will always be a Jonathan. But today we're going to use the Granny Smith. Um, so I'm going to real quick go ahead and peel these up and cut them and then we'll show you what we're doing after that. Okay, now we're ready to start making uh, our first item and we're going to be making the apple fritters that I told you about earlier. So I have peeled and cut up the apples. Now I did leave just little bits of the skin on there because the nutritional end of my facts tells me put some vitamins in there. So I didn't totally get it off of there, um, but for the most part it's off. Now this recipe calls for two cups of apples, two tablespoons of sugar, and I'm making an extra batch here just because I'm gonna have too much dough. So you're gonna see me doing it twice. And then it calls for two tablespoons of butter. And we're gonna be pre-cooking this so that it's going to take care of melting that butter. And I don't have any flour in this, so I don't have to worry about the flour lumping up, and that's why I can just dump it in there and not have to mix it ahead of time. It also calls for a teaspoon of cinnamon. Oops, of course I'd open the wrong side. And something that I do, just I like to throw in little tips, that's what I do. But whenever I open these up, I only cut it half open so I have a nice edge inside to level it off and I don't have to use something else to do that. And it also helps to minimize the amount of air exposure that you have to your spices because that does age them. And then I'm adding a little ginger. I like ginger in my apples. Um, the recipe didn't call for that. But like with any recipe, you don't have to stick with it. Uh, that's the nice thing about um, recipes. So now we're going to take this over in the stove, and I'm going to cook this just until the apples uh, begin to get covered with everything, and the butter is melted, and they just start to soften. You don't want to overcook them and make them completely tender, because if you do that, they're going to turn to mush. So now you see that our apples are cooking, and I'm going to be real honest with you. Um, the amount of sugar and things that you put in there um, really depends on the particular apples that you have. You can see I don't have a whole lot of liquid in here, but I really wasn't getting any. So that told me that my apples were tartar and that I needed to add a little more sugar. So I'm going to guess I added probably another tablespoon. You see they're, they're still very firm. They're not real soft, but this is about the stage that I want to take them off to go ahead and make our apple fritters. So I'm gonna take these off, throw the others in to cook while we make the apple fritters. We have our apples cooked, and you can see it just has a moderate amount of juice in there. And this is our bread, and since we're not doing a class on bread, I went ahead and made that ahead of time. That is something that we could do. Uh, normally, as soon as I make my bread, I start rolling it out, I don't let it raise. But due to our time constraints today, it has raised a little bit, uh, but that's not intentional. 
So this is only going to take half of my bread. So I'm going to take it and I'm just going to spread out what flour I have on there. When you're working with bread, um, you don't want to overwork it because the more you work it, the stickier it gets, the more flour you put in it, the heavier it gets. It just isn't as good. So I'm using a very, very small amount of flour and I'm just going to knead it just a tiny bit. And then I'm going to take and roll it out into a circle. You want to take and put your pie filling on one side of it. Oh, we're going to make it really good. We're just going to put it all in there. Spread it out. And then you're going to fold this side over. And then you take and put cuts in it, slits. And I just use this because I've already got it and why have more dishes than what you need. And I put several in there because I want the apple and the apple juice to seep through like this. Then we're going to take it and we're going to roll it up just like you would a cinnamon roll. And then we're going to cut it. And then you take your knife and cut your pieces. and press it down so that it looks like an apple fritter. What we're going to do is we're going to put one of these in each of the fryers and then we will show you how they look after they've cooked. That is your basic apple fritter with lots of apples. Now the other thing that you need to know is that you should always spray this before you put it in the air fryer. If you spray it once it's in the air fryer it's going to cause it to smoke. Um, also, it will reduce the non-stick film that is on the fryer. Okay, so now we have our finished apple fritters. Um, I had a little extra, so I went ahead and put two in the Cuisinart. This is the black air fryer, and this is the other, the emerald uh, air fryer. So what I did was I just mixed up a little bit of glaze. Um, it's just powdered sugar with some milk and some vanilla. Um, and normally I put almond extract, but I'm found that. So I'm just going to glaze that over the top. And it'll look like it came out of a bakery. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to make French toast sausage. And so for this, we're going to cut the crust off of three slices of bread so that we have one for each. In fact, I'm going to do four because I have a feeling I'm going to have leftover egg and stuff and I, I don't like to have food go to waste. So we're just going to very quickly and easily cut off the crust. And then we're going to take our sausages. These are pre-cooked. You can just use any sausage that you want to, and you can put it in the air fryer and cook it. Um, the only problem with that is, personally, I would want it to cool down a little bit um, before I made these. Um, that's really, again, a, a personal preference. So we're going to take and roll a sausage in the bread and I'm going to kind of flatten it out as I go a little bit. And then I'm going to put in one toothpick, and I like to put them where they show, so people don't forget that they're there and they're not going to get poked with it. And one of the reasons that I'm pressing down 
is it makes it stick a little better. And I noticed that was coming apart, so I pressed even harder with this one, so it will be less apt to come open. Okay, then I'm going to take a half a cup of milk and two eggs. And then I'm going to put in a fourth of a teaspoon of cinnamon and a fourth of a teaspoon of vanilla. And I like vanilla, so when I'm doing it just for myself or my family, I let it kind of run over. Again, that's a, a personal thing. I also like to put almond extract in this. I kind of like the flavor of almond. Some people don't like it at all. So we're just using vanilla today. And as you know, or should know, or, uh, cinnamon is hydrophobic, just like flour. And so it's going to resist beating in and that's just normal. It's always going to do it, doesn't matter how you put it in. But when you pull it out, it sticks on it, so you get the same results. Now I put that into an oblong pan so it's easy for dipping. And then I'm going to take these rolls and I'm just going to put them in there and they say to let them soak for 30 seconds. So I have already sprayed our trays here. So I'm going to go ahead and put them directly in. This is the results of our French toast sausage. Um, these came out of the Cuisinart. This one came out of the round one with the pull-out drawer. And this one came out of the emerald, this one. for you today. Um, this is chicken cordon bleu and I made it yesterday for the first time. I've made it before where I make a batter and I dip it in the batter and I was trying to figure out how that would work and so I went to the one of the cookbooks that I showed you and got this recipe and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. So the first thing that you have to do is butterfly your um, chicken breast. So in case you don't know how to butterfly I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to do that. I've done them all but one it's very simple to do. Um, I usually remove as much of the fat on there as I can before I do this just because I don't like it being there. And our table is at a slope so things kind of move. This is a temporary table so kind of hang in there with me on that. Then you start with the thickest edge of it and you take and just cut down through it right as much in the center as you can and after I get it part way through then I just start dragging my knife through and when you butterfly you don't go all the way through and you want a pretty sharp knife for this and I just keep lifting it so I can see where I'm at and my knives are pretty sharp so they go through pretty easily so there it is butterfly the next thing that we have to do is to tenderize it and really what tenderizing does is it's just breaking down the tendons in it to, to make it more tender and in order to do that you have to break them. You can do the edge of um, a saucer and hit it with it but it kind of gets chicken everywhere. Um, we have one that you can just put in and turn a crank and it pushes little cut marks through it. Um, what I'm only doing a few, I use this one. And as you push down, these blades come out and it actually cuts the chicken as you go through it. So because we're on a temporary surface, I'm going to turn around and do this and try to get you to be able to see what I'm doing at the same time. So I like to really tenderize it. So 
So I go one way and then I go the other. And it's real tall in here, so I'm going to do a little extra. And that's it. I generally do that on both sides. And if you have a big family, you're worn out by the time you get done. Okay. Now, all I have is just some plain flour in here. It tells you just to salt and pepper the meat and then um, dip it in the flour, then in egg, and then in the panko breadcrumbs and Parmesan cheese. Um, I think that if you don't season your flour, which in this case the flour is going to be right up next to the meat, that you lose a lot of the flavor. So I always season my flour, and that's just salt and pepper. And I do it fairly liberally. And then I'm also going to lightly season the meat. Uh, you saw me season the flour, and I'm just gonna stir that in. And then I also season the meat. And I laid it out so that we don't have to handle it too much. And I'm just gonna tell you, I try to be very careful when I'm dealing with raw poultry. So I have a little eyedropper that I keep Clorox in and I put a little bit in my water so I always feel like everything is sanitized when I'm dealing with raw meat. So I'm going to um, go ahead and season these. I have salt in this lid, it's just the way I like to do it. You can add other seasonings if, you can, if you'd like. You can also flip it over and do it on the other side. For me, this is just the way I do it. Um, then I'm going to beat up a couple of eggs And they don't tell you this, but if you noticed when I did the um, French toast sausage, there was a little bit of egg that didn't beat up very well, and that's because we used milk. Anytime I'm dredging with egg, and if I would have been making that for my family, I put water in here instead of milk. It leaves it tender. Milk has a tendency to make it tough. So I'm gonna slip a little bit of water in here, and then that way you won't get the big blobs of egg. Then in this other pan, I'm going to put in some panko breadcrumbs. And I'm pretty liberal with it. And Parmesan. Now this is really simple. The next thing that you do is put approximately two pieces of ham down on each chicken breast. And I do three because I like ham, and I think most people do. And I think if you only put two with chicken breast this size, you're never even going to know the ham is in there. Then you put your cheese on top, two slices of each. And what I do is I stack them, fold them in half. Well, they usually break, but this has been sitting out for just a little bit. Because we're going to roll these up. Okay. So then I go ahead and put out my toothpicks so I don't have to handle them once I've handled the chicken. And then you just simply roll them up. And put in a toothpick. And I always put them at an angle. I feel like it holds them a little bit better. And if there's a narrow end, I start at the narrow end and go to the wide so I don't have as much that would fall out of it. Okay, now we're going to take them and we're going to dredge them in the flour first, then in the egg, and then in the Parmesan breadcrumb. And they say to put it in with the open side down. Okay, we're going to air fry these at 350 degrees, 7 minutes on one side, and flip them in 7 minutes on the other, and we'll be back. Okay, we have finished the chicken cordon bleu. Um, these two came out of the emerald one over here. 
this one came out of the big round black one and these two came out of the Cuisinart. Um, I cooked these together in each of the ovens. This one took quite a bit more time than the other two, but I feel like the chicken is done and I hated to cook it any longer, but it's just not browning nice and evenly like it should. And a lot of the topping came off in the oven. I didn't have that problem with the other two. Okay, the results are in. Um, the feeling of our samplers were uh, they all tasted great. None of them tasted better than the other. I will tell you that the emerald one took quite a bit longer to cook. Um, and when it did finish, we didn't get the nice brown on it that we got on the others. Um, the first pick by appearance only is the Cuisinart. Second is the big black one and then emerald. And again, that was only based on appearance. So glad you could join us. We hope you had some fun with us and try these recipes and check out your books. Thanks.